Since the Ukrainian invasion, I've had a few of you guys ask me to make a video on Russia Ukraine, but there's just one slight problem with that. My knowledge of Ukrainian history starts and ends with Andrei Shevchenko's penalty miss in the 2005 Champions League final. I also aim to add value to my subscribers' knowledge base by exploring historical topics that don't receive particularly wide coverage. I think everything that can be said about Russia Ukraine has been said. So here's my compromise deal. I will do a video on Russia, but it's going to be through the lens of China rather than Ukraine. In a World War III scenario, this is a crucial alliance, and so this video will equip you to know the alliance well by filling you in on the history, how it's changed since Xi came to power, and what it could mean for the future. So we're going to start today by actually going all the way back to the 1600s. By the way, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single China video, and in addition to China, you can become an expert in Australian history as we launch our new series, Labor, Liberal and Lies, next week. But around about the year 1640, Siberian Cossacks started to settle in the Amur River Basin, which was land claimed by the emerging Manchus, who would then go on to rule China as the Qing Dynasty. The conflict between the two was picked up again in the mid-1800s when Southeast Siberia was annexed, and the Qing were forced to cede the territory over to Russia. But fast forward all the way to the 1920s, and both regimes had been overthrown. First, the Qing were overthrown in the 1911 revolution, and then the Tsars were overthrown in the 1917 Bolshevik revolution, though it took over half a year between Tsar Nicholas stepping down and Lenin taking power. Unsurprisingly, this new Soviet government backed the growing Chinese Communist Party, but things became trickier when Mao Zedong emerged as the unrivaled leader by 1934. Others in the party, like Zhou Enlai, supported the Soviet model of communism, where a revolution began in the cities with industrial workers. Mao, on the other hand, believed the revolution should begin with rural peasants, making it a much more Chinese style of communism. And so, with Stalin now as the Soviet leader, his intervention became calculated. They firstly supported the Jingjiang clique warlords in Western China. Basically, the 1881 Treaty of St. Petersburg gave parts of Jingjiang back to China, and so the Soviets were still keen to maintain influence in the area. But when the Japanese invaded China, Stalin held off from heavy intervention until the last days of the war, when he occupied Manchuria, probably to gain sway in the peace negotiations. If you've been a long-term viewer of the channel, I don't need to tell you that the two major powers in China, Mao Zedong's Communists and Chiang Kai-shek's KMT, went to war after Japan's surrender. Now you'd think, okay, so obviously Stalin would back Mao's communists, but it actually wasn't that simple. In terms of exercising control over Central Asia, a divided China was perfect for the Soviets. And so it wasn't until it looked like Chiang Kai-shek was going to win the civil war that Stalin decided he'd throw his weight behind Mao by providing key machinery and weapons. This, amidst many more factors that you can see in this video here, proved pivotal, and Mao emerged victorious. But having been internally unstable for four decades, Mao needed to build a new society. And this is where the Soviet experts came in. The Soviets had rapidly industrialized in the 1930s, and so these experts guided China in its attempt to industrialize in a post-war era. But by 1956, Stalin was dead and his successor, Nikita Khrushchev, criticized him for his use of terror and for creating a cult of personality around himself. These exact criticisms obviously extended to Mao too, and so this was the beginning of the Sino-Soviet split. Threatened by the new regime, Mao launched his Great Leap Forward, which was an attempt to rapidly industrialize and overtake the Soviets as the economic leaders of the communist world. Though this was a disaster for Mao, the battle lines were drawn, and the two were now diametrically opposed to each other. In 1969, Brezhnev and Mao actually had a border skirmish that lasted for seven months, and this Sino-Soviet split became even worse when Mao met with the great enemy, Richard Nixon, to start the process of normalizing relations with the USA. It wouldn't be until 1989, when the Soviets were in decline, that its leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, actually went to normalize relations with China. China was a rapidly growing economy and was crucial for the survival of the USSR. Now, as you'd know, the Soviets couldn't survive and they fell in 1991, and a new Russia was in economic decline throughout the 1990s. Though, thanks to Gorbachev's meeting with Deng Xiaoping, China remained a close partner with Russia through their decline, but Russia was left with no choice but to accept the fact that they were the junior partner in this relationship. Okay, so since Xi has come to power in 2012, he's essentially followed an approach of flattery towards Moscow. He's inferred that the two are strategic equals, which is just blatantly not true, and Xi has personally described Putin as being a similar personality to him, with the two often exchanging birthday phone calls. However, in addition to the pleasantries between the leaders, Western sanctions against Russia have also created economic glue between the two. 
Firstly, America's Magnitsky Act prohibited the entry of Russian officials alleged to be involved with the murder of Russian tax lawyer Sergei Magnitsky. Then when Russia invaded Crimea in 2014, the USA led the world in placing sanctions on Russia. With their oil and gas prices sliding, Putin turned to Beijing for increased trade. Xi welcomed this initiative as Russia would prove a vital ally in challenging American hegemony, and from this point onwards, Xi and Putin would experience a few years of particularly close cooperation. For example, the Shanghai Five Alliance was replaced with the Shanghai Corporation Organization, a security alliance that included both China and Russia, in addition to India and Pakistan, and then several others. Now, India is obviously the surprising one here with its tense relationships with China and Pakistan, but for India's economic interests, they can't afford to alienate Central Asia. The other interesting thing about this is that Iran has observer status, making it clear that this Chinese-driven web of nations is not being led by America. Russia has also been included in the Belt and Road, which you can learn more about here. However, China has made it clear that Chinese infrastructure projects won't interfere with Russia's Eurasian Economic Union. In 2015, Xi and Putin put in a dispute resolution mechanism to deal with potential conflicts between the two. Russia and China have also participated in joint military exercises and naval maneuvers in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and then the Black, Baltic, and even Mediterranean Seas. And then finally, when basically the entire world sanctioned Russia after their invasion of the Ukraine earlier this year, China gave economic aid and opposed the use of sanctions. As the Russian Western chasm has once again reopened, the Sino-Soviet chasm is certainly closed. For all of Xi's words of flattery, there's no question that China is the senior partner in this relationship, but Russia is to still serve a valuable purpose. Firstly, Russia's oil supplies reduce China's dependency on imports from the Gulf. The Strait of Hormuz and the Strait of Malacca are particularly vulnerable choke points for Chinese energy imports, and America's policing of the freedom of navigation principle means that Russia's energy supply reduces the risk of an energy blockade. Secondly, as we've seen this year, Putin is far less risk averse and far more comfortable with military intervention than President Xi seems to be. The classic example of this isn't Ukraine, but actually Syria, where Russia intervened to support the Syrian government. Whereas the UK and the US supported efforts to target ISIS, they did not approve of Russia's support in targeting other rebel groups. Russia's willingness to intervene in these conflicts is perfect for President Xi. If the EU and the USA are tied down in Europe or the Middle East, they are far less equipped for military intervention against the Chinese. For Xi, he doesn't need the Russian military to win anything. He just needs them to divert Western resources. And that's about all the time we have for today. If you liked the video, make sure to hit the like button to let YouTube know that this is worth watching. Stay tuned for next week as we begin to bring you up to speed on Australia's political history with Edmund Barton, Alfred Deakin, and the unbelievable three-way tie in the 1903 election. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.